Now we've been talking a lot lately about different software that you can be using. There's Maya, there's Blender, we haven't really talked about Cinema 4D and Houdini and so on, but there's a lot of different 3D tools out there you can use for a variety of different things. I'm not a big fan of the whole software war thing of trying to pick one or the other, which one's better, which one's worse, doesn't matter. However, a lot of people are sleeping on Maya for one specific set of tools. Now, is it another tool set that Autodesk bought at some point and shoved into Maya? Yes, but does that change the way I feel about it? No. It's flipping awesome. What we're talking about today is Maya's motion graphics tool set, which hang in there because for a lot of people, that doesn't sound like it's something that's all that useful for animators, for modelers. Like, why would you care about motion graphics tool sets? I'm gonna show you. This is my absolute favorite thing in all of Maya. I love it. It's the coolest set of features that you can use for animation, you can use for modeling, you can use for a whole bunch of stuff, procedural effects. It's awesome. It's kind of if Cinema 4D, After Effects, Blender, and Maya all had a weird baby together, and it lived inside of Maya. It's really powerful, and it's what I consider to be Maya's secret weapon to make it a really cool piece of software. And if anyone watching is a Blender user and you're like, oh man, I don't wanna watch a Maya video, you can do this in Maya fairly easily and then move it to Blender if you wanna use Cycles or EV to do the rendering over there. Totally up to you. Either way, you're gonna see some cool stuff in this video. And in case you're new here, hi, I'm Sir Wade. I do a ton of animation stuff here on the channel. And if you enjoy this video, wanna see more like it, hit subscribe down below, ring the notification bell so you don't miss new uploads. And if you would like to see me use these tools live, maybe come up with ideas and suggestions of things that I should try making with these tools, happy to do it live on Twitch, a couple days a week, links below, or to support the channel and get more educational resources, a link to my Patreon as well, down below. Now let's stop stalling and let me show you the coolest thing in all of Maya. I'm super excited to make this video, MASH motion graphics tool set. All right, so here we are in Maya. The first thing I'm gonna do is go to the top left corner, change modeling to effects, and I'm gonna go to the motion graphics shelf. This is the best way to work for MASH. Also to make sure you have this enabled, you wanna go to Windows, Settings Preferences, Plugin Manager, and then scroll down until you see MASH. You wanna make sure that this is loaded. You can also make sure this, as well as a few other things are unchecked if you're trying to get Maya to boot up faster. I have another video on just speeding up Maya, faster workflows, things like that. But in this case, we're gonna go ahead and load this plugin, pretty much the same thing as Blender's add-ons at this point. Once you have that loaded up, we're going to take any mesh. Literally, I could delete this and start over with a cube. I could start over with a plane. It does not matter at all. Any mesh, a full character, a cube, a prop that you modeled, keep it low res for now because it'll be faster. You're gonna select the object and you're gonna click on this button in the top left corner to create a mesh network out of that object. What happens is you suddenly have 10 of them. Now, it's important that I show you how this works under the hood. That original cube still exists. It's hidden, it's right there. These are what's called instances of this cube. Each of these instances are called points, a mesh point. They all reference this initial cube. So if I change the scale of the cube, they inherit those values. If I rotate it, they do the same thing. So the scale, the rotation, the translation doesn't matter, but it's, it's inheriting any of the changes, which also means geometry changes, because if I go ahead and move this face, it'll do the same thing. We'll come back to that in a bit. I'm gonna hide that for now. So we now have a mesh object. And if I go over from the channel box to the attribute editor, you see all this magical stuff. A lot of good stuff here. Let's break it down. The first thing that happens is you get a distribution node. So I'm going to talk about nodes a little bit. So if I go to the mash editor, we're going to see what these nodes are. You can treat them like layers. Um, they're basically just like layers, but they're also nodes. Doesn't matter. What you're getting here is a stacked view of each of the effects that you're applying in order. The order matters. You can turn them off and on different things. When you create a mesh network, it takes that original geometry, sets it as the object to instance, and then creates a mesh distribution node, which is basically just saying, how do you want to distribute these points? Do you want them in a line? Do you want a certain number of them? Do you want them in a certain offset distance from each other? Things like this. So if you want to have a hundred of them, you'll notice they're all just kind of stacked on top of each other, but there are a hundred cubes. I can offset the distance, Let's bring that number down just so I can see them better. But you can kind of see, I can adjust the number of points, the distance between them. I can offset them in Z space. I can rotate them. I can keyframe all of these values. Regardless of what I'm doing, you can right click any attribute and say set key, set driven key, create an expression, whatever you want to do. But this is just putting them all in a line. We can change this to a radial network where I can change the number of points in a circle. We can make it a full ring and you can mess with all kinds of different attributes. So let's just say I've got a hundred of them. Let's crank up that radius. And another thing too, is if these sliders don't go far enough for you, you're like, oh, I wanted it bigger. These are just suggestions. You can change this number to anything you want. If I just make this 30, it changes the slider to now reflect my new range. So don't let the sliders tell you what the limits are. There are no limits, believe in yourself. 
But with this radial network, I can change the axis, I can put it on the ground, I can have it kind of do a spiral staircase up with the offset. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do. We can do a sphere, which doesn't really look like all that much. So let's crank this up to a thousand points. Let's make it 10,000 points. Once you get to a certain point, it starts to get hard to see what you're looking at. So that's where you want to go to your renderer settings. You may want to make a few adjustments to the viewport. For example, ambient occlusion can really help define objects. And you may also want to turn on anti-aliasing if your computer can handle it. But even though I have a really beefy desktop computer, I do this for demos. When I go speak at schools and things like that, I always show these tools and I do it on a laptop. So I'm on a laptop most of the time when I'm traveling and all of this works fantastically, very quickly. It doesn't matter what computer you have, you can do this, especially if you're just using a basic cube. The more geometry in that original object, the more that this is gonna take processing power wise. But just so you know, the overall system here, it's very fast. Now there's other distribution methods and we'll talk about more of them in a bit. But what you need to know is that every single one of these layers, you can turn it off and on, which is just turning off the distribution. They don't exist at that point, turning them back on. Every single one of those has a strength dropdown. That strength applies to you know whatever you want it to apply to. It's an on and an off scale. So turn it off, they don't get applied, turn it on, there you go. It gets really interesting when you randomize that. <laughs> Sound effects are completely required. In fact, let's go professional with the sound effects. To demonstrate this a little bit better, I'm gonna to go to a grid network. So I'm gonna go ahead and change the distance between all these, the grid size, and now we've got 25 times 25 times 25 cubes. It's a lot of cubes. You can see they're all in there, whole bunch of them. And if I change the strength, I can, again, turn it off, turn it on, I can randomize that strength. I can also step through. So that's just in order. Each of these points has a number assigned to it. And so you can have it go in either direction to build in a certain way. You can also use maps, different textures, different things. If you want to carve out certain pieces, that's fine. There's a lot you can do. I'm not going to cover every little detail, but what I am going to show you is what happens when you start to combine effects. So this is all just distributing them. This is all just putting them in the scene. We haven't done anything yet. What I can do is start to combine different nodes on top of each other. For example, I'm going to say random node add and it automatically has some values attached. I'm gonna turn them off. And by the way, sometimes this mash editor is a little buggy. It's not showing me the random node. So I'll just close it and reopen it. it. Happens all the time. Now you can see there's a randomization node, which is currently not doing anything. So if I randomize position and any axis, you can see what it does. Rotation in various ways, uh, scale. And very quickly you can see, ah, we have our buildings. That's our city. And so what you can do is you can combine the rotation values, for example, to just make this crazy, like, shape of cubes. All this, by the way, exports to a single mesh, so it's easy to work with and do other things with. But let's just say I want to do that and I want to have it randomly kind of come apart. I can just use the random step strength to have it do that. And if I have it on, I can also change the random seed if I don't like the way it's doing it. If I don't like the pattern, I can adjust the randomization just to mess with it. But I'll go ahead and also adjust the random position just to get a little bit more variety out of that as well. So now we just have this crazy, uh, just, just go crazy. There you go. Crazy. It's crazy. But you can see we just have this insane network of cubes that we can just move through and try to like animate the camera through or whatever you want to do. Let's do another node. Let's just add, for example, a color node. I'm just going to add a few more of these, show you what they do. Um, there's a color node. So if I just pick, let's go, let's go orange. It's the opposite of blue. It'll stand out nicely against this background. So I can do a base color. We can randomize the hue. So we can just go full rainbow random. You can change the saturation of them. We can change the value, which is kind of dark and light. There's also blending mode. So if you want to really get into it, you can do all kinds of stuff here. But again, there's a strength node. Every single one of these has a strength node. So I can turn off the color, turn on the color, randomly turn on and off the color. So if that's something you need to do, you can have colors kind of popping up. Or again, you can have it come from the bottom to the top because it's step. We've only just scratched the surface. I want to show you a lot more, but I want to do this in a little bit of a better way. So let's say that I turn off the color. Remember that we have that original cube. I want to show you something else about how the instancing works. If I take this original cube, this is what they're all based off. I can scale it and you can see they're still linked. What I'm going to do is assign a new material just to this face specifically. I'm going to say, make it a Lambert. Let's go orange. And then we'll make this top color. Nothing crazy, just you know, two colors and the rest is gray, but you see that applied to all of them. So if you make a change to one, they all inherit it. A vertex and I'll pull this up. So it's a very, very powerful system because it's entirely modular, which is again, just one big mesh that we could easily delete the history and just have an object. So let's go back to the random node and I'm gonna just boost this up way more and say, these are, you know, this giant, which by the way, if you look at how this originally looked, it was this, which comes out to here. What I'm gonna do now 
is control this in a more interesting way that really helps us for animation. What I'm gonna show you here is fake effects, procedural effects that we don't have to simulate. If you want destruction, this is how you can do it. This is how you can fake it. Go to the fall off object section of the random node. So fall off object is a way to either connect geometry or different things. I'm gonna right click here, I'm gonna say create. And what it does is it creates this little kind of locator thing, which by itself is just saying, hey, the random node now is attached to this thing to so say, it applies only when this object gets close enough to have influence over our network. And you can kind of see what this is looking like. And again, it's not simulating, it's all procedural. The, the values are all predetermined, so it doesn't need to take any time to simulate. It just has to blend between off and on. We can also click over here to invert the fall off. So if I make this bigger, you can see that it actually puts it back together. So if we just have it here, there it goes. It kind of undisintegrates, or we can have it stay here make it bigger and move it away and it will disintegrate. And we've got our Avengers effect just like that. Easy. Something I like to do is to create a sphere and put it in place. Actually, I'll just do this, lock it with my Anambot buttons. And what I'll do is I'll just parent it from one to the other. So if I move this ball and I move it in, it just destroys the cube. But you don't have to keep it as geometry. This object can be a whole bunch of different stuff. The fall off object, it can be a sphere, cube, a NURBS curve. You can have it be particles specifically. You can have it be a mesh and then it will look for a mesh. If you select mesh, you need to come down here to connections and then it'll ask what you're trying to connect it to. So if I come back and let's just grab a torus, which is our donut shape and go like that. What you'll wanna do is middle mouse drag whatever the object is from the outliner into the shape in. And now it's gonna use that object as the driver. So if I pull this in, bam. Now, the only trick here is it's, it's kind of teleporting them out. That's because the fall off object had that, that distance, that kind of inner and outer radius that it could blend between. In this case, it's kind of off and on the moment it hits the mesh, it's just activating the full effect. And you can mess with different things to try and get that working to your liking. You can mess with the inner zone. You can, there are ways to play with that. Another thing we can do is just come back to the random area and just adjust these values so that maybe they're not as aggressive. That way the values aren't that aggressive and whether or not you're choosing to animate this, cause you can animate this, maybe it's just a matter of trying to get a look for you know set dressing, just trying to make it feel like this object has been here, caused some destruction, and then it's just been left for a couple of years. Obviously we need to tweak some stuff, but you get the idea. Let's move on to other cool things. Now mesh is especially good for any kind of set dressing, layout, building a scene, modeling, effects, lighting. There's, there's a lot of things you can do with this. I'm gonna show you a few examples just that I've pre-made that I can just quickly breeze through and show you some stuff. But before I do, let me show you one more thing about the distribution node that I think you're really gonna like. So if I just make a new scene and we're gonna take this cube once again, throw it in a network, we get that linear distribution once again. And what I'm gonna do this time is go to the distribute node and change it from linear to mesh. It's once again gonna be looking for a mesh input. So I'm going to middle mouse drag the torus into the input mesh here. Now it's going to use that as the source of where I can kind of create these points from. You can actually fake an emitter. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. But what I can do is animate, move this around, and these points are just stuck there from now on. Now, if I scale it, you can see it gets a little bit weird. They don't quite lock on. And there are some behaviors that we can adjust if you want to mess with that. So for example, some things you can do. Let's get like a thousand of these. Make this look really cool. We can get like greebles basically, if you know that term, to make this object look really big, like a spaceship. I can do the same thing where you do, you know, strength in this case starts to look a little bit different. Now we get kind of like a, a wormhole type of deal going on. You know, so we can get creative with it. But another thing I can do is change the method. So right now it's on just scatter randomly across the object. We can go uh, by vertex. So using this method, we can have it build around in order. You can do face center, all different things. You can also voxelize it, which if you don't know what a voxelize is, it's kind of like pixels, but 3D pixels. So if I make this very, very large, you'll be able to kind of see what the deal is if I kind of up the resolution and then hide the original object. You can see that we now have the object made entirely of, of cubes which again, I can adjust the size of, and I can still have the object move these cubes. So they're still tied to it. It's a little bit slower now because it's voxelizing. And if I come really close, you can kind of see what's happening here. So voxelizing is different and, and interesting in its own way. Coming back to scatter, I now have 20,000 points on this giant torus donut thing. What I'm gonna do is use the push along normal and I'm gonna push them into a force field. So if I come inside here, you can kind of see that we are now on some kind of Elysium like alien planet type of deal. And I can push them into this kind of Saturn's ring effect. So that is pretty cool. So now we have like this wormhole looking thing. There's a lot of stuff you can do 
To me, it always reminds me of space, where you can get some really cool effects, and you can still do a lot of cool things. So if I take the original geometry, the vertices still make a difference. So if I use the twist component, it'll actually spin them in a ring. So you can kind of see they're now orbiting the surface in a cool different way. They're kind of coming out of that hole and spinning around the object. And that's just geometry stuff. You can still go back. You can still do all the same stuff with all the nodes. You can add a random modifier just to get a little bit more, you know, debris looking stuff. And then if you don't want it to be quite this perfect circular ring, that's where you can introduce all of this. And now you can have this crazy debris orbit field. And if you haven't seen the video on making your play blast look like renders, then you may not have seen that you can use hardware fog, which I'm going to mess with the settings a little bit here. You can actually use the hardware fog to move through your scene and create this kind of fake foggy depth. Things that, you know, if you don't want to move it over to Blender or render it in an Arnold, you can still get some really cool effects. Now you've seen some cool stuff that it can do and some more kind of effects driven things. Let me show you the practical examples of what you're probably going to want to use MASH for in your everyday workflow, on your short film, on your thesis film, if you're a student, depending on what you're doing. These are some of the most useful things that I show to people to say, hey, this is how it's actually practical to use. Now at some point I'd love to do a video getting into like all of these and doing like a full training thing on all the nodes. So if you would like something like that, let me know. Um, especially if there's specific things you're wondering about, also let me know that. There's some ridiculous functionality here. So some of the more advanced things are, right now it's just using one cube. And if I were to have multiple pieces of geometry that I wanna have it cycle through randomly or in some order or something, you can do that. So if I take all three of these and try to put them in a network, you'll notice it's just gonna use one of them. You're not gonna see much of a difference. So what I need to do is first of all, let me crank up that number of points and just reduce the amount so we can see them all. What I'm gonna do is add an ID node. An ID node allows it to kind of actually pay attention to what's in there. Right now it's just repeating the pattern. I can have it go in a certain cycle. I can have it fix just one object and I can have it switch objects. Very helpful for motion graphics workflows or just random and then adjust the seed until we have a, a selection that we like. You can also have probability so it kind of skews one way or the other if you kind of want it to have a preference of which objects it's generating, whatever you want. And beyond that, you can do all kinds of stuff. I once had some friends ask me, they were working on a short film and they wanted to have kind of this, this old timey cobblestone stone floor and they had their modeler spending weeks and weeks and weeks modeling the scene. We well, can do it in about 15 minutes if you just take a few shapes, bang up the objects so that they don't feel quite so perfect, replicate them, randomize them, and then just make duplicates of the entire street to create this giant stone looking floor or fallen leaves or whatever this is. And you just use a color node to give it that tint, randomize the hues and saturations, and you're pretty much done. It doesn't take long at all. You can still make adjustments or make other custom pieces, but it's a floor. Do it really quickly and move on. Also in the animation classes I do over on Patreon, I had somebody ask about bookshelves, making uh, you know a library full of books, which would also take a long time to model generally. All you have to do is make one bookshelf, make a book, duplicate it, replicate it, and colorize everything. You're pretty much done in another 10 minutes. People think I'm exaggerating when I say you can make almost anything in Maya in under half an hour. With the MASH system, you really can. Using the audio node, you can have any property move based on audio. It doesn't have to be scale, it can be rotation, it can be color, really, whatever you want. You can use a curve node to have a bunch of geometry follow and animate along a curve. You can do cool stuff like this. You could do something more for the background of your scene, like a multi-lane highway for the background of some city shot. Obviously you could use real cars instead of cubes to get the same effect to look a lot cooler, but you know, five, 10 minutes, easy. You can use the dynamics mode to take advantage of bullet physics. It's an actual physics simulator that you can do all kinds of crazy stuff from emitters, you do constraints, you can have pieces break apart, stick together, and you can set any mesh as a collider so your character, other objects in your scene, a sphere, whatever you want, you can have it kind of break and crash through stuff. It's very flexible and very easy to learn. I've used it for modeling to create these gems in the Breath of the Wild kind of Zelda trailer thing I made. There's a ton you can do with mesh, and now you kind of have the basics to get started learning. So if you want more videos from me on this topic, if you have ideas that you'd like me to try and different, I don't know, things we should tackle. Once again, if you want to see any of this live, link to Twitch down below. If you want to jump into any of my animation tutorials, mentoring, one-on-one -on -one kind of workshop and tutoring, as well as a bunch of other educational resources, I'll link to my Patreon down below. If you enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe so you don't miss more like it, ring that notification bell, hit the thumbs up so more people see it, share it with a friend, all that good stuff. Either way, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you get a ton of use out of this tool, just as I have, and I will see you in the next video.